Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorraine Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is James McGrath Morris, a wonderful biographer. You, you write biographies, but you also write what's called narrative nonfiction. What is that? Narrative nonfiction is the idea of stealing the best techniques from fiction and applying them to nonfiction. We can't make up anything, but we can build up suspense, we can use foreshadowing, we can try to create a real story that's compelling enough that people want to turn the pages. Well, you, you certainly do. You certainly succeed at that. Thank you. What made you choose, out of all of the literature, the, all the genres, what made you choose biography? Well, as a child, I know this sounds lugubrious, I read obituaries in ah. newspapers. I grew up reading obituaries in the New York Herald, the New York Times, the Washington Post. I'm talking about well-written obituaries written by reporters. Yeah. And they're, they're little miniature lessons in American history or world history, if you mm. think about it, because not only do you learn the life of this person, but you have to learn the context in which they operated. Mm. So you'd learn about railroads, you'd learn about inventions. And I became enamored with that, and, and I realized in the end those were biographies, and that's what I ended up doing. Uh, you founded an organization called Bio. What is that? Mm. Biographers International Organization is a professional association of biographers around the world. And we get together much like the mystery writers get together, the romance writers get together. You know, our business is a very lonely craft. I mean, yeah. we sit at a computer, we sit in an archive pawing through somebody's diaries, and it's a lot of dull hours of loneliness. And we crave the idea of being able to talk to others in our business. So every year... We have an annual conference, and we have a newsletter, and we, we get together. Well, how many times do you get to do a biography a biography of a living person versus all the archiving and the yeah, historical well, research? Well, I've chosen primarily to write about really dead people. I mean, uh -huh. Pulitzer died in 1911, for instance, and that was one of my big books. Yes. Um, there's a real difference in writing about people who are still alive versus writing about people in the past. One of the practical problems is people who are still alive very much want to shape their story, so it's a much oh, more difficult yes. thing um, than, than it is to write about somebody in the past. And also, we need distance. You know, there have been biographies of Stephen Jobs and, and now in Santa Fe, this extraordinary opera, but we're still very close to what he did. Uh, give it another 50 years and we'll have a very different view. Uh, there is something about the perspective of distance that changes our views of people's significance. Um. I don't know who said this, but what, maybe it was even your wife. Living with a biographer is like living in a menage a trois. Yes, it's very true because it's an all-absorbing task. Um, I'm thinking about my subject all the time, whether I'm taking a shower, making our morning coffee, or going to bed. Or sometimes I get the conversation, Jamie, are you with us? Because you can tell yeah. my mind is wandering. So it, it, because it's a person as opposed to a history, that person really invades our lives. With my biography of Ethel Payne, this black civil rights reporter from the 1950s, I found a recipe in her archives, and so I thought I'd make the, the, the item of food is a way to connect to her. So it is very much like a living person. And it becomes so real in some sense that I've always chosen not to write the death scene or visit the grave site mm. until the end because it's a, for me it's a life journey with somebody's life and I don't, I don't want that door closed until I'm ready. How do you choose if this, you know, so it takes mm -hmm. several years. Oh, to, years, yeah, yes. sometimes. So are there some that you just... You know, we're originally interested in and then just thought, no, I don't want to do three years with this. That happens. Um, usually the problem is more the other end, getting a publisher to support the work. Mm. Book sales today are tough. Um, I mean, if you're a very famous writer, um, you can write pretty much whatever you want. But those of us who operate under that, that level, um, it's, we often make a hard case to a publisher to support a book because they're going to spend a lot of money on you before they see a dime from the book, what we call an advance. So I may have a brilliant idea 
call up my agent and say, here's my idea, and there'll be dead air at the end thinking, well, it's a brilliant idea, but I'm not going to be able to sell it. Or he could say, if you really want to do this, I can sell it. What that means is you're going to have to find a lot of your own funds to support it. Mm -hmm. Um, So sometimes I tell people, especially young people, because I do a lot of workshops with young people, that I don't write in order to earn money. I earn money in order to write. Uh. Sometimes that's the case. But passion is the most important thing. If you don't think it's a project you can live with day in and day out for three years, even if you complete it, the book will ring hollow. It doesn't mean that you have to love your subject or admire your subject, but you have to have this all-consuming interest in knowing and understanding and building a story about that person. And if that's lacking, you, you can't produce a book that anybody wants to read. And I would think a certain amount of respect is necessary. Respect is um, true. What the, most, the, the biggest ingredient in writing a biography truly is empathy. Because the likelihood is it's going to be a significant figure or else no publisher would, would want to do it. So somebody like Joseph Pulitzer who changed American history or Ethel Payne who reported on the civil rights movement or my last book about Hemingway and Dos Passos, what you need is empathy to understand their behavior. Hemingway, for instance, was a really awful person. I mean, no one has ever said he was a nice guy. But understanding what happened to him to make him that way is the key to being able to write about him fairly. Well, I want to address each one of those books, but I have a very personal question for you. So you, as a biographer, Mm -hmm. also have a biography. So if you were studying your own biography, would you, in the light of that, tell me a little about your background? Ooh, it's a tough question. Um, because a biographer always has to choose where to begin and uh-huh. where to end and exactly. not bore people. Falls in your well, part. I'm, I used to say to a lot of people that I never let schooling get in the way of my education, which is a Mark Twain precept, because I didn't make it through high school, and I didn't graduate from college until I was 40. So I have a very <laughs> odd path to being educated. But as I told you, I loved obituaries, and obituaries is really what taught me about the world. And I love to read, and I always read fiction and nonfiction, not necessarily are the ones that my teachers wanted me to read, mm-hmm. which is what got me in trouble. But I was raised abroad. I was raised in Paris and in Belgium as a child. I lived a ro- lot of places in the East. Came to New Mexico first time in 1977 and worked as a reporter in Albuquerque. Covered the state legislature for KRKE Radio. And then as a reporter, if you have any success, you start getting calls. And I ended up moving to Missouri to work for a radio network there. And then eventually to Washington, D.C., where I worked as both a radio and print reporter. And I mention this because part of my writing style I've discovered, you know, when you're, you're thinking about yourself, is in radio you have to be short. And you have, to, you have to be able to pull that little comment from a person. So if you're writing a 60-second piece, you know, you're using an 18-second actuality of that person. I think that's helped me a lot in being able to weave a story that uses very selective bits of quotations as opposed to people who have been trained only in print. Um, I ended up also living in upstate New York, working for a newspaper there. Spent 10 years in the magazine and book business. Then I had a midlife crisis that led me to teach high school for 10 years, which I loved. And that's why I got my college degree and master's (laughs) degree. And then I came back out here to New Mexico, and I've been here for 12 years and happy as can be. Um, Another woman who comes from print was Catherine Graham. Mm, Very much so. And she, of course, had the Washington Post during the, the Watergate era, but... I read that when she wrote her autobiography, she researched herself as if it were another person. That is the way you should do an autobiography. The, the big difference, a lot of people ask, you know, what's the difference between a biography and autobiography and a memoir? Yes, what is the difference? Yeah. <laughs> a memoir is a recollection. It comes from the French word uh, memory, memoir, mm-hmm. in the sense that you're really dealing with your past on the basis of your memory, what you remember, what influenced you. It's a very personal journey. So if you get a few facts wrong, it doesn't really matter because we're looking for an emotional story mm-hmm. about your abusive parents or whatever it yeah. might be that's so compelling. An autobiography properly done is a biography by the subject themselves. Now, famously, when presidents and people people like that write the autobiography, they have a world to research. And so when they say they had lunch with Menachem Begin, they can go to their calendar and put the date in. Whereas a memoirist might say, oh, once upon a time I had lunch, you see. So a well-written autobiography would be a biography of themselves with a very particular bias. They're obviously not always going to reveal their less good moments. And a biography is the one that's independently written, much like a newspaper independently writes about a politician. Um, I like to compare biography to portrait painting in that 
we bring to the canvas all of our own acculturation, socialization, those kinds of things. So um, as a man writing about a woman, I'm different than a woman writing about a woman. As, a, as somebody who's not Jewish writing about bullets or is Jewish, you know, these are cross-cultural things. And so I bring a different thing to the canvas. Most important is to produce a fair rendering of the person, one in which if they walked into the room and looked at the portrait, they might say, not necessarily flattering, but not wrong, but fair. And that's what we aim to do. Um, in your uh, blurbs for your many books, you, you have more Pulitzer Prize winners <laughs> talking about your work. Yeah. And so let us start then uh, with Pulitzer since uh-huh. he's come up so much. So this one you wrote when? Oh, that's a tough question. About 10, 10, I guess I started it in 2005 and I think it came out in 2010. Right. Roughly. I'm sorry. I don't know the exact. They're they're like, unlike children, we don't always remember the birth date. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But anyway, yes, that one was the one that took me. I was well funded. I spent five years of doing research, went to Hungary, went to London, went to Paris. His papers were enormous. Just the physical work was enormous to pull it off. The subtitle is A Life in Politics, Print, and Power. So why did you choose Joseph Pulitzer? Well, this in this case was actually an editor's idea. Uh An editor at HarperCollins contacted my agent. I had written a previous book called The Roseman of Sing Sing about Uh an editor who worked for the world. And I had another book proposal circulating. And Tim Dugan, who is a very famous editor, who now has his own line of books, uh, contacted my agent and said, would Jamie be interested in writing a book about Pulitzer? So it was a very different process. Um, I had to come up with the concept and write a long 100-page proposal, but it was only for them. It was what's called a preemptive deal. And they gave me enough money to go off and work for five years on it. And Pulitzer's a very significant figure. Most people know the Pulitzer Prize but know very little about him. But he's really the, the, the man who gave birth to the modern mass media. Everything we do, including this show, Yes. goes back to who Pulitzer was and what he did in the 19th century. And what I love, I, I haven't read the whole thing, but the way you put it in context, his whole life, as he marches toward mm-hmm. transforming journalism as we know it. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things you have to do, and I don't know if I do it well, but with biography is you have to explain things within context because um, the invention of the modern mass media was a startling moment of the 19th century. And to explain that newspapers were politically subsidized, like the Missouri Republican and the Missouri Democrat, and, and the creation of a printing press that could print a, hundred, a million copies in a day, which was, for them was as startling an invention as the Internet is to us, making those analogies, setting the context is an important part of our work, or else no one understands why it is we care about these people. And so you can trace so much of what's happening in the media now oh, yeah. to his yeah. work. Well, we talk about fake news a lot now. Yeah. And fake news existed in the 19th century. I mean, famously, uh, during the Spanish-American War, uh, Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst had this vicious competition selling a million copies a day. Some of the reporters made up stories. Those were truly fake news. Yeah. The difference today is that while we have newspapers that make up stories, I mean, the National Enquirer certainly is not yeah. fact-based, is that <laughs> politicians are weaponizing fake news. They're beginning to say that all the media participates in it. That's a fundamental shift from the 20th century and 19th century. That's not the way it used to be. Well, we're speaking today with James McGrath Morris about his wonderful biographies. Um, I don't know how we can counter the the blanket charge of fake news and and can you explain a little about the origin and and where we stand with the term yellow journalism sure yellow journalism was when these papers in the 19th century were engaged in sensationalism of extraordinary lengths these papers weren't necessarily making up anything there was a little bit of that there was still a murder that occurred but what they were doing is describing it with incredible adjectives and diagrams the body was in this carton Mm -hmm. the head was found here in a way to make it so sensational that people wanted to read the newspaper, much the way the evening news might say, coming up next, you right. know, 40 million people, you'll know a story you don't want to miss, whatever, same yeah. kind of thing, because you had to sell the paper. They both had comic strips that featured a yellow kid. Ah, yes. And so they became known, the world, and the New York world and the journal, as the yellow sheets. And people who were so upset with their approach to journalism began to derogatorily refer to them that way. 
But they were also missing the point. These were newspapers that catered to the lowest classes of Americans, the new immigrants that had come to the Lower East Side. And they were writing about their story in a way that provided dignity to these folks. So really, it was almost a classist attack on mm. the paper for what they were doing. But it's always stuck. So if you say that's a yellow journalist, that's not a good thing to say. And that's, that's tied into fake news, too. Well, another element of the news that disturbs me is the old line, if it bleeds, it leads. And yeah. when we look at our local Albuquerque news, sure. there's a lot of if it bleeds, it leads stories. It's particularly true with television. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunately has a lot to do with what happened in the 70s and 80s with television consultants. And they found that, you know, murder was a story that drew people to... and. And historically, in defense of them, that is also the case with metropolitan newspapers. Murder was always the page one story. That, and we read murder mysteries. I mean, this is part of our mm -hmm. almost our reading DNA. But as a consequence, it has a very distorting effect on reality. As you well know, studies have often shown that when crime goes down, as it has in the United States, people don't necessarily believe that study because when they turn on the news, breaking news, murder in the Northeast Heights, we'll have our helicopter there in two yeah, seconds. Yeah. And yet the most significant event affecting everybody that day could be something that happened in the roundhouse, changing the school funding and those kids mm -hmm. the next day their lives are different. But that's not a compellingly visual story. And so much of our news is visual today. It makes it very hard for reporters to do that kind of work. Well, we would like it. Uh, you know, they say leading, you know, a knifing mm. in the South Valley. Well, that's not news. That's every day. Correct. So it, it would be great if there was a headline that said, no knifings in the South Valley today. Yeah. But we're not going to get that. Exactly. Um, I'd like to move on to this sure. beautiful book, Eye on the Struggle, Ethel Payne, the First Lady of the Black Press. I, I, I'm, this is such a moving, wonderfully written book. Who was Ethel Payne? Well, you're very kind. Ethel Payne was one of the most significant 20th century reporters, but unknown to 85% of the population because she worked exclusively for an African-American newspaper. And during segregation in the United States, African-American institutions operated in complete invisibility with white America. So the Chicago Defender that she worked for was not merely a Chicago paper, any more than we could say the New York Times is merely a New York paper. But who read it were African Americans. So as a result, when we've been writing our histories, a lot of these institutions, like the Chicago Defender, are left out of this tale. So f she died in 1980, and for some reason, no one was doing her story. And I came across her story, and I had no problem finding an editor in New York who supported it. And I ended up writing this book, and it, it wrote itself because she led such a fascinating life. She was on the ground in Montgomery during the bus boycott. She was challenging Eisenhower in press conferences. She was in Little Rock during the desegregation. She was everywhere. So by telling her story, I could retell the civil rights movement. But most importantly, not through the eyes of a white historian many years later, but through the eyes of a black reporter on the scene, hence the title eye on the struggle. And the struggle, there had to be a personal element to the it struggle was. too because I mean how often were black reporters called on in uh, press There was both an enormous physical danger for her to go to the south as a black, as a woman, and as a reporter it was very mm -hmm. dangerous. But also there was an enormous personal loss. See a woman in the 50s as a professional was an anomaly. And the men that she met would often suggest to her, if we want to have a relationship, you're going to give up this little foolishness of reporting, mm -hmm. kind of pat you on the head, mm -hmm. patronizing idea. So she ended up being a, all alone all her life. She gave up a personal life in order to do the work she did. She wasn't unhappy. I don't want to suggest that. But there was a tremendous loss in her life to have done that. A and great sacrifice. Was that she way. finally acknowledged? Was yeah, there was a postage stamp. In 2002, I believe it was, the U.S. government put out four postage stamps about women reporters. Oh, three were white, and she was the fourth one was black. And what was interesting to me is that the three white ones all had several biographies written about them, but no one had written the biography ah. of Ethel Payne. And that was part of my case of, you know, she's overdue. Um, one of the other part of your case is how the black press helped change America very and much the world. Did. Yeah. So what kind of international coverage. Well, 
there were a number of things. She perceived that the, uh, the freedom struggle in the United States was not just an American struggle, it was a worldwide struggle. So she went to Africa, she went everywhere around the world and, and reported on that, connecting the fact that this is, you know, she met Nelson Mandela early on, Winnie Mandela. In fact, there's a wonderful photograph in the book of her interviewing Nelson Mandela just after he got out of prison. She's 79. And this sense tells you something about her humbleness and her sense of humor. The, uh, on the picture, she wrote a little thing on the back of the picture, and she said, lots of people interviewed Nelson Mandela, and he's in his bathrobe with her, and she <laughs> writes, I'm the only one who did so while he was in his pajamas. <laughs> so, you know, humor is very important when you're facing darkness. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know well, as those of us who have been in the press, um, a, a morbid story often stirs up jokes in the newsroom. It's not disrespect for what happened. It's a, it's a coping mechanism. And she saw a lot of horrors. Mm. Well, now <laughs> we've got your latest book. This is, uh, oh, it's called The Ambulance Drivers. Mm -hmm. Hemingway, Dos Passos, and a Friendship Made and Lost in War. Now, this is an amazing work to me because it is so vital. It is so, like, like you say, this uh, narrative nonfiction it is a page turner. The relationship between these two, I'm hoping you can read a little of it. And maybe um, just want to, our friend Hampton Sides wrote such a well written blurb, <laughs> I, very, if you don't mind. Yeah. Here is a story of love, war, and politics writ large. A story of two literary lions trapped in a double helix relationship more powerful than either will admit. In this intricately braided dual biography, Moore shows us how the two novelists needed each other, even as they differed, often drastically so, in the way they negotiated the gravitational forces of their times. These two men come to life, mm -hmm. and the long friendship and the ups and downs, it is quite extraordinary. Um, I knew who Dos Passos was. And, and many people don't. Yes, but I, I don't know whether I'll be reading the Forty Second Parallel or you. Mm -hmm. You know the long, long. They're long. hard to read. Yes, they're hard to read. But his integrity, and his beliefs were no. such a, a, a beacon for him. Mm -hmm. Whereas maybe not so much. Well, he he's a perfect literary foil with yeah. Hemingway. I mean, he he's everything Hemingway's not, and Hemingway's everything he was not. And and being able to write about these two created a kind of tension that oh. novelists would die for. Yeah. Um, I, I'm very fortunate. I kind of hit my stride with this book in the you sense really that if do. you're, if you're a runner, and I'm a modest jogger, I you know I'll do 5K races. You know when the legs work and everything works, and that certainly happened in the book. And I think it helped produce a kind of fun book to read. So maybe you would even read. Is there a passage that you can give us? Um, I can probably find one fairly close quickly. Um, one of the keys in in writing a book. Um, is to try to do what journalists do, which is to create a lead uh -huh. to get people to to read the whole story. Yeah. And a prologue in a book is very much the same kind of thing. You try to bring all the elements, and in my case, I never read the, write the prologue until I'm finished with the uh -huh. book, in order to try to create an, an engaging yeah. invitation. So the beginning of the book starts in 1924, and these two writers are meeting in a Paris cafe. The famous of the two is John Dos Passos. Hemingway at this point is a stringer for a Canadian paper, living off his wife's trust fund, and he hasn't sold anything. Yeah. But they were both ambulance drivers during World War I, and they both saw the horrors of the war, and it really affected them. And they were both plotting a kind of literary revolution. They felt that writing would, needed a change to cope with this new modern world. So they dreamed of penning the great books of their generation, um, but they were almost alone in having witnessed the war that defined their generation. So here's what I write. Dos Passos and Hemingway had held front row seats as part of a cadre of men volunteering for ambulance duty on the killing fields of Europe. In fact, Hemingway still carried shrapnel in his body. The men had confronted hardships and danger to a lesser degree than the soldiers, but they'd been afforded a greater view than that seen from the trenches. It was exhilarating and harrowing. The war created in young men a thirst for abstract danger, called Malcolm Cowley, who had served as an ambulance driver, not suffered for a cause, but courted for itself. Now, six years after the end of the conflict, John Dos Passos and Ernest Hemingway burned to put on paper what they had seen and experienced. The Great War was over, but not for them, not yet. And 
They and hopefully also, what happens is you want to read on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they were taught about creating a literature for their time. Exactly. The lost generation, exactly. the sad generation. And every generation does that. I mean, you think of, of younger people today um, uh, using rap music to portray a founding father. Uh, using <laughs> Twitter to express themselves, uh, Instagram. Um, we all do that. We all feel in many ways a sense of inadequacy about what tools we have from the past. And I think the Stephen Jobs opera is a great example of that, trying to portray a man who, who changed the world in such an intimate way. You know, as soon as we're done, what are we both going to do? We're going to reach for iPhones yes. and check our messages yeah. and check in with our kids and maybe send a picture. That's yes. such a change. And so trying to find a new way to explain that is very much what that opera was doing. Well, you have a thread through all of your work about journalism. and Yes. And well, that's been my great love. And, and what you describe Hemingway from his training as a reporter to just the facts, ma'am, that sort of thing. It's the best possible training, isn't it? For was it, you know, became his writing style. And everyone right. said it's so refreshing. It's not so verbose. They and also said it was so shocking because it was so stark and yeah. naked. Yeah. 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 No yeah. strings of flowery adjectives. <laughs> exactly. Nothing. Um, but one thing: who became ambulance drivers? What? what well, you know, we didn't. The United States didn't enter the war until 1917, and it began in 1914. And when the war broke out, Americans in Paris volunteered to take trucks and vehicles to the front line to bring French soldiers back to the American hospital in Paris. So a cadre of volunteers began, and they raised money to bring American, young Americans to Europe to serve as volunteer drivers. Well, in order to drive an ambulance, you needed to know how to drive. And who knew how to drive in the United States were wealthy people. You also needed money to get there. Who had money were wealthy people. And it might be a good idea to be able to speak French. So as a result, kids from Harvard, Yale, all the elite schools volunteered. And there was an extraordinary core. John, Heming uh, John Dos Passos, Hemingway E. Cummings, Walt Disney. Uh, Walter, I mean, you know, Croc. I mean, all these people ended up being ambulance drivers. Um, hmm. And then when we entered the war, the U.S. Army took over the Corps of Ambulance Drivers, and that was the end of the volunteers. We just have a minute left. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, what's your next project? I'm so excited oh, I'm about this. I'm thrilled to be this. talking about this in New Mexico. Yes. I'm writing a biography of our beloved Tony Hillerman. Ah, perfect. And speaking of which? a former journalist who became a writer. Exactly, exactly. And and like you say, much beloved. I think yeah. one of the most beloved writers New Mexico has ever produced. Oh, I mean, yes, so, and But what's your time frame? I would guess it will be out in 2019 or 2020. Remember, okay. these things take a long time to do. Oh, yes, yes. And he lived a very rich yes. and full, wonderful life. Yeah. Well, um, I just can't thank you enough for coming. Our guest today is... James, not Jamie, James McGrath Morris. I really recommend this book, The Ambulance Drivers, about the relationship between Hemingway and John Dos Passos. But it affects, it, so, it changed how I looked at, at my own history and American mm -hmm. history. It was really uh, the two polar opposites and then changing the, mm -hmm. the very intricate relationship. Well, thank you so much well, for joining us. Well, thank you. It was an us. honor to be on your program. Well, I'm... Uh, We'll be back for Tony Hillerman for sure. Great. Thank you. I'm Lorreen Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.